Good morning, everybody. Hope you're all staying warm. Um, so for, <laughs> for our project, um, the title of our project is actually Music's Effect on Film, and uh, particularly in our scenario, it's film in the 1930s. So um, what we did is we drew a lot of inspiration from these you know, articles that we would see online and like fun creative videos and the professional videos. Um, and what they would do is they would, they would act out a scene and they would put like different music to it and it would change the entire feeling of the scene. And so we had this project that has to be focusing on the 1930s and so we said, well, what if we took films from the 1930s and um, took out the original audio and replaced it with you know, more relatable audio or you know, different or funnier or more dramatic or more serious and how does that, does it actually work? Will it change the actual intended effect of the scene? And so um, what we've done is we have two selections, two movies uh, we have King Kong from 1933, the original one, and we have The Wizard of Oz, which is uh, 39. And uh, what we did is we took a, a clip from each of these movies, and we're going to show you the original clip, only about 30 seconds or so, and then right after that, it's going to be the same clip, but with different audio. And then you're going to see if it... Yeah, so like the change in music is going to change like the tone and like your reaction to the scene, pretty much. Yeah, well, so. those are the two videos that we put together with a different sound for you guys, so hopefully uh, you guys saw and kind of understood how each of the different, you know, audio files, when, replaced, when replacing the original, totally changed the entire grasp of the entire scene, so. If you guys understood that, that was our project, and thank you for watching. <laughs> um. Questions, concerns? <laughs> Uh, uh, the just, King Kong listening. one was like weirdly like that was coincidence like was with the mouth opening and stuff that was like we were like yeah. hey, let's put this song to the King Kong and then so we put it on there and right when he said it they just like his face did all the same things and I was she like screams. yeah it was like this yeah, is solid yeah. <laughs> so we just went with that <laughs> thank you guys all right so I did my presentation on Pan's Labyrinth and the Red Version so what my project was was writing a paper comparing both of these films. And what I found was a lot of their themes were shared, as well as a lot of like the techniques that they used to film the movie. And so I tried to find some of those scenes that looked alike and that showed similar themes, and I put them up here. It's not letting me. All right, so, but a little bit of backstory from the Red Virgin. This is Hildegard Rodriguez. Hildegard Rodriguez Cabrera was an activist for socialism and sexual revolution. Her mother, Aurora, raised her alone and raised her to be a woman of the future. So she was, I think, around two, three years old when she started reading. And she graduated university before she was 12. And by 16 is when her mother killed her. And so yeah, she had a short life, but she was supposed to be like a lot bigger, but she was still able to have an impact in, in Spain. So in Pan's Labyrinth, we have um, Ophelia and Captain Vidal. And these are two of the, the main protagonists of the movie. And so she's supposed to be the princess of the underground and she would die, and then she came to the mortal world, and that's where she's 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 seen here now. She's trying to go back to her old home, and Vidal is the leader of the Spanish troops, and that's her stepfather. So the first scene that I found that was similar was the birth of uh, two of their kids. So Aurora having Hildegard, and Vidal having his son. In that scene, she's showing a lot of power. She's telling her, "No one can touch your baby." Like. She's totally in control of the situation. And Vidal, his wife just died even birth of the baby. And he doesn't even care throughout the whole scene. He's just looking at the baby instead of looking at you know, his dead wife or paying attention to the ceremony. Because he knows he has his baby and with his baby, he has control, he has power. He's gonna raise it to be just like him, someone that wants power. So these two scenes began to show us how these characters were greedy for a lot of power. And this is one that shows us like when they lose their power. So these are both of their faces 
during scenes where they had just lost a little bit of that control. This is when Hildegard was giving a speech and she swayed off from they, what she was supposed to talk about that ha they had practiced. And over here with Vidal, this is where one of the one of the guys that had just captured hunting around the woods <coughs> was speaking back to him, so he decided to bash his face in with a with a bottle and then shoot his dad. So those reactions are just showing us how they how they react when they have their power taken away. And the last one I found was this one of death. So it's like showing us a little bit of what happens when they lose their control. So in this scene, this is after she just uh, didn't do what her mo mother wanted to do during the presentation. And she had a little vision about killing her. And she was the matador and she was the bull and she ended up bloody. And then after this scene, she goes ahead and shoots her daughter in bed. And on this other side, this is Ophelia. And this is both at the beginning and at the end of the movie. And this is after Vidal shoots her because she took his baby. So when he lost that power, he didn't care about anything but getting that power back and then killing his daughter. And this was the same for both of them. They lost their power to their own kids and they just couldn't take it because of that grief. And they ended up killing both of their children. And uh, yeah, that's what I found was in between both of those films. That's the end. Started. Uh, so what I did was recreate a 1930s style radio broadcast. And aside from the three songs that I pulled from the 30s, all of it's 100% original. I recorded my friend here, Chase, and added some filters and effects and used an accent that I thought would demonstrate what a radio host from the 30s would sound like. So there's ads for stuff like scotch tape, Snickers, mini golf, stuff like that was either popular products or activities that people in the 30s did that you would hear on the radio. And then a few popular songs at the time. Top of the morning to ya. My name is Joseph Tom. I make my living as a farmer and I was born and raised right here in cloudy county Londonderry. Northern Ireland. I pride myself on having clean polished boots, a cane long enough to whack an idiot at a distance, and great skills with animals. Indeed, it's a good quality to have a knack at making an easy living. Ask anybody in the county. The first person you come to when you've got problems with animals is Joseph Tom. I make a living traveling all over the country, buying cattle and horses and trading them and it sure pays these days. Not to toot my own horn or anything, it's just people would rather have me barter a favor for a favor rather than pay a vet who doesn't always have the most financially healthy decision. I very much enjoy attending a Kelly every so often to blow off steam and have some crack with my friends and family. I'm a father of Four girls, Maud, Alice, Gladys, and Dorothy, along with wee Harold, my youngest child and only boy. I'm married by my wife, Wilhelmina Christie, strong lass if I've ever met one. Yes, we went out to dinner, the seven of us, and she was appalled at wee Harold's food. She says, oh, waitress, you must take this back. This hamburger is as hard as a goat's knee. I'd be mad to pay five quid for it. She's a thrifty one, so she is. The other day I went to the doctor with a little dizziness, wondering what was the cause. And the doc tells me, I'm surely not malnourished, just constantly dehydrated. He says, Joseph, I never thought I would say this to a fellow countryman, but you don't drink nearly enough. <laughs> the irony. I said I beg to differ. You could imagine the howl we got out of that. A man like me who spends as much time with a bottle of whiskey as rum as a pirate and I don't drink nearly enough. Oh, well, getting a crack out of jokes has always been a strong suit of mine. Me dad was so strict that I had to find the light side of life quickly just to survive me ma'am well. She died giving birth to me, poor wee woman. I was the 13th out of 13 children. They say she was so weary, she just 
laid down and died. So 13 isn't my lucky number. And luck matters a powerful lot to us Irishmen. Perhaps that's why my dad was so harsh with me. Well, anyways, I don't like talking about that. I've lived a good life and done quite well for myself so far. Ask anybody in Claudie. I bet they've had a good crack and a drink with Joseph Tom. I nickname just about every, everybody and everything, and it sticks. The government housing near downtown are all white, and I name the whole area the White City, and it's still called that to this day. Surely the bus driver calls out the White City when the bus stops there. There's even a White City shopping center these days. Look it up. I also name the riotous part of town the Congo. People don't get along there. There's lots of commotion and arguments everywhere you go. It's really quite a bother. Ordinarily, I wouldn't deem myself in such a high stance in a public manner. My strong belief is that a man who knows his high standard proves it by his actions and not his words. Real men know where they stand. Anywho, we Dorothy was cutting the holly to use for Christmas decorations the other day, and the poor wee crather cut herself badly, I must say. She was bleeding like crazy and sat down on the porch and passed out. When she got up, I said, Oh, the wee ones got you. You've interfered with their magical bush, and you never do that without saying your prayer first. What a rough week the girls had. Gave her just a terrible haircut down at the barber's. And she came home crying, believe it. I told her, oh, a man on a galloping horse wouldn't notice. Sure, it's nothing to cry about. If they'd cut a bit of her ear off, now, that would have been something to cry about. Dorothy is quite bold, though. I do admire her willingness and determination to be the best without regard of others. You know, she wins sprint races against most lads. Her sisters are all so envious, and my, is it obvious. I remember one day she saw a black cat and a white horse cross her path when she was about, oh, five or so, and she didn't know, but I knew she was a lucky one indeed. I always say there are only two kinds of people in this world, the Irish and those that wish they were. Well, thank you all for meeting me today. I'll leave you with this. May the rose... May the road rise to meet you. May the wind always be at your back. May the sunshine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields, and until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. That was him. This is me. Um, so obviously there's a lot of... Uh, strong belief in superstitions. People may agree or disagree with them, think that they're wild or far-fetched, but um, these, all these things are, I, don't, I, I can't speak for all of Ireland, but definitely within my family realm and my grandma, she still strongly believes these things to this day. And faith was really big in Irish society, and not only with religion and superstitions, but in general, people like to believe that um, these actions that they deem superstitious should have a specific reaction or sound reason or just something to follow, you know, because without reason or a story behind these things, it's kind of doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to most people. And um, not all reasons for these strong superstitions are specifically known, but these things show similarities in their own culture that separates them from other European countries and even other countries within the UK. And the reason that superstition has so much meaning and value to these people is because they wanted to be on the path of faith or God's path or just feel like they're in the right place at the right time type thing. And these little things like going, in the, going back into the house for 10 seconds, maybe you would have gotten into a car crash, maybe you would have found a better spot in the parking lot, maybe, you know, um, my belief is that the reason for strong superstitions caught on so strongly um, because people believed in myths and not only believed but valued them. And the more a group of people begins to believe um, 
something or a story just explodes within their culture, um, the more it, it shapes their perceptions and, and everybody just tends to go with the flow and that's how their culture just kind of came about. And even if the myths and superstitions are a bit far-fetched, as long as it made sense to them and they believed in it, then they all believed in it. And that's why I think people stayed true to these superstitious values. Um, one example of a story that is evidence of superstitious values is one superstition they have is you can't put one shoe on and tie it before you put the other shoe on. You have to put one shoe on and the other shoe on and tie one and tie one. And the reason why they all do that is because of a story called Sean's Curse. And um, Sean stole a neighbor's p the tail, the fable, or I guess it is a real story, or maybe it's been skewed by the people over time, but um, he stole a neighbor's pig, and even though the authorities had dogs and um, they were fast, Sean was running and, and, and was getting away, and his feet got hot and he took his shoes off and um, ran through the creek and his feet became wet and he found a hidden spot to sit and rest and dry off for a minute, but um, just as he was resting, he heard barking dogs and the police coming after him and he grabbed his shoes, put one on, laced it up before he could the other one, and sprinted with only one shoe on, and the one foot that he didn't have um, laced became cut, and he was unable to run, and the authorities then eventually found him, and he got in trouble. But, yeah. Thank you, guys. <laughs>